Welcome to the Pathways to Profitability podcast. Personal tales of business success, where we hear local business owners' personal stories of their trials and tribulations that got them to where they are today. Here's your host, Cheryl Mucha, CEO of CFO Your Way. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Our guest today is Robbie Samuels. He's a multi-passionate entrepreneur, author. So much to unpack here. Robbie, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. <laughs> so I like to just start, just give our audience a, a little glimpse of, of who Robbie is and a little bit about some of those entrepreneur journeys that you're going through. Well, prior to the pandemic, I was best known for uh, teaching people how to network at events. Uh, I'd spent a decade uh, speaking on that topic. I had a talk called Art of the Schmooze. I left my career running fundraising events to focus on this as a, uh, as a business and subsequently launched a podcast, uh, my first book, did a TEDx group coaching program. So I was poised in early 2020 to be an overnight success, 10 years in the making, and then <laughs> nobody needed. <laughs> but we but we needed those 10 years in the making, right? We did need those 10 years in the making, but then no one needed the skills I had acquired around eye contact, business cards, shaking hands, and body language. So I had to figure out how to show up and add value in a different way. And right. I wrote nine ways to network in a pandemic and released that on March 12th, 2020. And the next day... I hosted my first virtual happy hour, which was one of my suggestions in my article. Right. And uh, well, I didn't plan for that to become a new business, but I've been hosting that a weekly event ever since. And while I wasn't charging for it, the first two years, it was just free and open to anyone. It attracted a lot of people and it led in middle of April, I launched my first offer in the new environment where I was um, teaching people how to, how to be more confident and competent using Zoom. That became a certification program. And I then started getting hired by uh, mission-driven organizations to strategically bring their events online with less stress and greater participant engagement. Next thing I know, it's late 2020. And in about eight months, I had uh, launched a six-figure company based on all new revenue streams. And by middle of 2021, I had, I don't know, it was like 2.3x <laughs> my previous year's um, revenue, which was the best year I'd ever had. So it was all phenomenal. And I worked, worked, worked. To make it all happen. Part of my secret of my success is that I'm a business growth strategy coach. So in the middle of all this chaos in 2020, I was actually coaching about a dozen entrepreneurs a week on behalf of a, a company. And when people started reaching out to me to ask to pick my brain, you know, can you help me with this or this, like, oh, you look like you know something about Zoom, my extroverted self would have just happily filled the calendar with social calls. But my coach brain said, you would never tell a client to do that. You would turn those calls into research calls. And so that's what I did. And my second book is really sharing that process about how to build an audience before you try to sell anything. So fascinating to hear, like, you know, you hear so many stories about pandemic and, you know, failure, growth, success, uber success. So I, congratulations. Like that's <laughs> it's just I love, I, well, and that's what this is all about, just hearing those stories. So we'll we'll dive into that a little bit more. But let's just rewind a little bit. What was the initial push or impetus for you to leave that corporate environment and start your entrepreneur journey? Yeah, so I worked in nonprofits for about 15 years before focusing on entrepreneurship full time. And I, I loved what I did. Um, I spent the last decade organizing about 25 uh, events a year. Wow. Um, fundraising events, galas, auctions, private dinner parties for 12, which, by the way, are more stressful than a dinner for a thousand. Um, <laughs> it's all in the details, right? All in the details. Yeah. Everyone notices everything. So um, I started doing this talk uh, for about the last five years. And it, it got to a point where I was taking vacation time to go spend a day across the state to do a talk. And I, I, you know, I was doing two, or two to four talks a month, but it was all for nonprofits and foundations. And I loved it. And I, I have a mentor who was really kind of a friend and a mentor who was trying to push me to, to just jump. And eventually, the job stopped be being as appealing because the people 
moved on. So I was the only one left in my department with a 10 year, you know, memory of what had been happening and everyone else was new. And so the, the, like the gravity pull was less there and the pull towards deciding to commit to this as a business and figure out what happened next was, was much more alluring. Uh, as, as she had said to me, uh, her name is Dory Clark and she's an amazing person, a uh, speaker, coach, uh, author, very, very well known. And she said, you know, you're going to know it's time to leave when your job gets in the way of your business. Wow. Oh, I've never heard that one before. I love that. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about the passion, even when you worked, you know, worked in that position for 10 years and the passion and the people, um, you, that's like a common thread of us as entrepreneurs doing what mm -hmm. we do and loving what we do. And I, I always preach and believe that loving what you do is so important. Life is too short to be miserable, especially in a position or, you know, doing yeah. whatever it is, is that is going to support the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. I mean, for me, I was really reluctant to um, chase money. So the skills that I had acquired were all about networking, which right. a lot of people said, oh, you can go help sales professionals, go, go train sales teams. And again, I did not come right. through the corporate environment for a reason. And so the idea of helping people sell more widgets, just, right. you know, it didn't appeal to me. And so I felt a little stuck in the beginning. I knew I, did, I, knew I wanted an audience that wasn't solely focused on nonprofit and foundations, but I hadn't didn't have that clarity yet of who I should be serving, which turned out to be associations and larger scale nonprofits. But I didn't have that clarity and, and that, that push to just sell to like anybody or sell to these kinds of people. I really was able to resist. Thankfully, I have an amazing partner um, and she believes in me. And so, you know, I, I didn't have to just say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. I think being able to choose to work with who I want to is a big part of what I think of when I think of success. I couldn't agree more with that too. And even, you know, even now, as you've obviously obtained success still to be able to choose, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, who, who you want to work with right. and, you know, choose who you want to let into that circle is, mm -hmm. you know, I've learned that lesson. Um, and although sometimes it's heartbreaking to fire a client, sometimes that's the best decision. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, that's some of the things that my clients actually have gone through. Um, I remember working with someone who had spent 18 years as an executive and career coach, mm -hmm. and she had a full docket, and she was coming to me wanting to launch a podcast. But I know that that was not actually the end of her dream. Her dream was to have a new book, have a group coaching program. Like She had a lot of other bigger ideas that she wanted to get behind. But first thing she had to do was figure out how to reduce her client hours by 20%. And so right. over six months she did, and then she also doubled her fees in that six months and started getting much clearer about who she served and building up a referral network to refer people out to. So that when right. she got the inquiry and it wasn't a good fit, and she had a very clear litmus test now, she right. could hand them, like literally make an introduction and hand them over to someone who was a better fit, which helped her say no and helped right. her focus on all these projects. Now she's got the book and like, it's all happened for her. So yeah, I mean, this is, I think we have to know who we're saying no to or what we're saying no to, to ever say yes to anything. Right. And why, you know, what that, what that, you know, there's, there's so much importance in that. Like, why yeah. are we saying no? And to be able to communicate that, but hearing you say, you know, knowing our value, charging our, you know, having our fees based on our value. I, right. you know, I'm still learning that. Yeah. And the, uh, the overall, potential client pool, you know, probably 85% of them don't get that. They just see the dollar that's, you know, on the line. Like that's where they go in the contract, right? Right. So what's, what is this going to cost me and helping them to see the value that we bring in whatever it is we do, because we're all experts yeah. in our field. I developed a model um, that's in my second book about how to discover your ideal client and um, if you have the expertise and you have the ability to, to provide the, um, the, the solutions that people are looking for and people will pay you, but you don't have the passion that is going to lead to burnout. And so too often our roster of clients is a little imbalanced. So you can have a couple of people where, you know, 
like to me, if I give somebody uh, three options and the third option is like the kitchen sink, I'm going to charge up the wazoo for the kitchen sink. Right, right. I don't actually want to do the kitchen sink. Right. <laughs> um, I'd rather them use it as a menu of options that they can like add to the middle option. Like, oh, I didn't know you could also do that. Also do that. Yes. But I don't want to do all 12 of the things. So right. it's just like, you know, occasionally I do find myself maybe doing a little bit of that. But through 2020 and 2021, I mean, I just was working. This is the first right. year where I really feel like I'm taking breaks and I'm balancing things out a lot more. But in 2020, after April, I took off Father's Day and Thanksgiving. And if, if and I mean, like, week every day that ended right. in Y, I mean, Thanksgiving doesn't even end in Y, so maybe it doesn't count. But <laughs> I worked every I day. Yeah, so it does end in Y, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, if I didn't have the passion, I don't know how, like, I, it was so much. It right. was, I still was, I still had the clients that I was working with on behalf of another company. And my own business was taking off in ways I hadn't anticipated. And it, it was a really interesting moment as an entrepreneur because there was no real fear of failure. Um, no one was looking at me because we were all so, so focused on our own self and our own business. And I could just try things and test things out and innovate and see what worked. And that was such a like, freeing moment in a lot of ways. And it was a lot of fun. And I knew that, you know, six months later in the fall of 2020, those of us that had done that, who had iterated and shifted and pivoted or whatever words we want to use for that, we're going to be in a much better position going forward than the people who sat and waited just to for it to go back to normal. And I, I kept seeing this really clear divide amongst entrepreneurs. Yeah, I love that, too. I mean, we speak the same language. Yeah. Um, um, not only the passion, but the trial and error and the figuring it out and just pushing, you know, persevering. And I think that's, you know, to be an entrepreneur, that's got to be in your bloodstream. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. And, and the ability to do that and and come out the other side of this in a much better place and being able to service our community, whoever our community is, in a way that is so valuable and so powerful. I think the hardest part for me is I'm, I am, as you mentioned in the intro, multi-passionate. And I started working on a new website in um, the end of 2020 and going to 2021. Mm -hmm. And it was solely focused on my virtual event design um, and my executive Zoom producing side of my business. And when I looked at the first draft, I realized it didn't mention anything about coaching or masterminds. And it just, I felt like I was missing an arm. And I wanted to, you know, put that back in. And so I, I really, I know I, I have a niche for each thing I do, but I don't only serve one niche. And I, and right. I think it took me a while as an entrepreneur to realize that was okay. And right. I have to just sort of build up the brand where it makes sense. And so for me, I'll, everything I do is about relationships, engagement, inclusion, belonging. Sometimes I do it through the virtual means. Sometimes I do it through coaching an, an entrepreneur on how to right. leverage their existing network to you know launch launch a new offer. Um, sometimes I'm in person as a connections concierge running the connections lounge for a client because that's a lot of the work I did beforehand and now it's starting to come back. So. To me, it all makes sense, which is why I actually don't have multiple websites and multiple brand names. It's it's all kind of under one uh, one umbrella because it's all about the work that I do and the work that I care about. Right. And it's all like all those pieces to the puzzle that fit together so nicely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're totally aligned. Yeah. My latest thing that. now is figuring out how to share what I offer in ways that are really transparent and not mm -hmm. just a funnel. Um, I'm not a fan of just moving people from point A to point B and point C without their agency. And so I have sort of a, I have a community where people can gather. I have a two hour offer, a one day offer, and the amount of money spent on the two hour and one day is actually applied to the 12 week if they choose to do that. And any money spent on a group program is then applied to working with me one on one. And I sort of been laying all that out really visibly in posts and in emails and you know saying like jump in wherever it makes sense and if you continue in the journey like you invest in you i'm going to match that investment right and i'm just trying to find other people who could help me sort of find it was, it's about inventing language i know other people think this way how do i attract those kinds of entrepreneurs into my corner so we could kind of support each other's efforts it's a sort of different model than what a lot of the the online businesses have been pushing and right um it's been it's been really interesting to see the response and see how people are Come join in. I love it. 
I love it. So let's, I want to talk a little bit about um, mm -hmm. your, your books. Yeah. So um, it's funny because I was just on a Zoom meeting yesterday and they started talking about writing a book and, and the advice to the book writer professionals in the room were like, write the first one. It's not going to be your best one. So write it and get it out of the way and then move on to the second. So tell us a little bit about your books and uh, yeah. your latest one I know was just published a couple months ago. So sure. So, um, so croissants versus bagels, strategic, effective and inclusive networking at conferences came out in um, 2017. And it really is the culmination of what I've been presenting in my talk up to that point, which I've been doing since 2009. And so it's it's very um, detailed and specific and directive about things you can do before, during and after you're uh, going to an event to be best prepared um, from from like thinking about how to plan ahead with like writing your uh, follow up letter first, like follow up email before you go and drafting that, but also fee positioning uh, the title croissants versus bagels is actually um, from my most sort of memorable takeaway. When you're walking into a crowded networking event, people tend to stand in these tight clusters, these shoulder to shoulder huddles that are impossible to break into. But if one person shifts their body language, that's the croissant, right? The bagel mm -hmm. with the tight circles. So right. that book came out. I'm fortunate that I got to do a TEDx talk on that topic at robbysamuels.com forward slash TEDx. Uh, check it out. I brought people up on stage to help me demonstrate that. And that came out, actually, it was released in January 2020. It was all part of the, you know, overnight success 10-year plan. Right, right. Um, but then this book is um, the one I wrote where I was talking about, um, I actually started writing this in 2018 after my first book, but I, I hesitated to publish it because for my first book, I didn't actually have a plan for what came next. And I wrote about this in my second book, how I was trying to iterate and come up with a pilot and a group program, and it all worked out eventually, but it did take so much effort. So for the second one, I wanted to really build out those programs a bit first before releasing it. So I put it away, got into lots of other things, but I kept getting asked the question in 2020 and into 2021, Robbie, how did you do that? How did you grow a multi six figure company based on all new revenue streams in the middle of a pandemic? And it kept coming back to the fact that I listened and did research calls and built an audience and you know, woke up my network to what it was that I was doing and how I could serve them. So this book is also very hands-on. Like you could read it very quickly, but there's all these exercises. There's a workbook that accompanies it. So smallestbigresults.com for the second book and croissantsvsbagels.com for the first book. And thank you for putting it up on the screen. Yeah, so there's, there's all kinds of free resources at that link as well as access to getting to the book. Perfect. I, I love the croissants versus bagels, the image that, you know, so many networking events that I've gone to. And I, and I remember my first networking event when I decided to be an entrepreneur and started this journey, the first networking event I went to was a room full, full of probably close to 200 people. And I stood at the door. I'm like, holy crap, what do I do? How do I break into one of these conversations without mm -hmm. being rude? So I love that, that image because yeah. that was in front of me that day. Yeah. It's, it's funny because Dory Clark um, had written about it in her second book, mm -hmm. um, Stand Out, and people would come up to her after and ask if I had a book. Like <laughs> she would talk about it in one of her presentations and I, you know, show a little slide about it. And so she was speaking globally and all these people yeah. were asking her and she would write me each time. And I didn't have the book then, you know, <laughs> so it would have been, that would have been my media tour, right. <laughs> but it really, it showed that that was a sticky concept, um, memorable, actionable. I right. really, that's to me, you know, I want to make sure people can take action right away on, on ideas. And I think my job besides, you know, knowing what I do really well to granular level is just asking really good questions. So I make sure I'm answering the right, answering right. the right uh, things people need. I think too often we jump in with advice, but we don't actually know if people need it. So All right. um, that's that's the practice that I've been focusing on lately is just better, better listening and just being there for people, being a resource rich um, coach or mentor. Great. So I, you talked all about working so hard throughout the pandemic, yeah. have things slowed down for you now? And how do you or what do you do to you know, have that work life balance? 
Yeah. So um, my my word of the year in 2020 was revenue, which was kind of a sad thing. But, but it motivated you and it, <laughs> it, it worked, right? <laughs> and then my, my word of the year for 2021 was profit because I recognized that earning money and having money is not the same thing. Right? And my word of the year for this year is hobby. Yay. So what, what is that? So, hobby? Um, yeah. Or so <laughs> one of the things that I managed to do is I, I now don't work Saturdays. Um, I, I now can say that most of this year I've not gone into my office at all on Saturday, which Good. was a big shift. Right. And then I don't it's get smart, on Sunday. Right? It's so hard. <laughs> Sunday I go in at nine o'clock at night just to do some things to get ready for the week. So I've actually reclaimed my weekends, which has been amazing. And I have young kids and we moved to a new area. So we're getting to explore on the weekends, all these festivals and things going on in the areas. Um, I planted a garden, which I had done in 2020. Um, couldn't last year because we had moved. So I planted a garden and we raised butterflies from caterpillars. Oh, uh, wow. And I'm listening to a ton of audiobooks. My wife has been queuing up books for me left and right. And so um, that's a big part of it. And I'm starting to do a little bit more travel um, I went out to the Pacific Northwest to visit my team, got a little bit of downtime. I, I was really confused about what I should do. I was like, I'm an adult. I have access to money and time, no kids. I have half a day. What am I, you know, I'm in a new city. <laughs> um, it's like, oh, wow. It's, it's been a while since I've gotten to new do that. concept, right? <laughs> like, well, yeah. So, um, so I think I would, I, the reason the word hobby is my word of the year is that because I am so passionate about the work that I do. Right. I need to be as passionate about whatever it is that will take its place on my calendar. Right. Because if there is no, if there's nothing to strive to leave the office to go do, I'm just content to like in the keep office. plugging away. Right. I do, I do stop about five thirty, six o'clock most days and I make dinner for my family and we put the kids to bed together. And then I'm off, you know, I was often going back to work at nine o'clock at night. And so now I think I also probably only do that two nights a week. I go back into the office and, you know, get, get a few right. things done. But it's, it, I think it's, it was like, I had to have something else that I as much wanted to be doing. Um, because I do, I love the people I work with. I love the event clients like Feeding America and California WIC Association, supporting these mission driven organizations with their virtual events. And I have these amazing entrepreneurs that I work with and right. seeing all their results and building a community right now. It's, it's a lot of really exciting pieces that I couldn't have foreseen a couple of years ago. I mean, right. it all, it's all new still to me. And I'm happy to hear that you garden. I'm a avid gardener. So if you ever need any advice or tips, I may. Questions, <laughs> please reach out. You're here on the East coast as well. So you're a little bit further South than me, but, um, you know, the garden is planted. So exciting mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so reach out if you need, need some guidance there. So um, just to wrap up, just tell our audience again, the best ways to get in touch with you. Um, and we'll also put it in the, the notes when the, the podcast is out there. But uh, just give a, sure. give a shout well, out. One of the best ways to get to know me and the work that I do and get access to a lot of resources for very little money is I host the Content and Connection Club. And the Content and Connection Club gives you access for just $25 a month to thousands of dollars worth of content that I've created, a weekly virtual happy hour where entrepreneurs come and network and we, I ask them great questions. It's very facilitated networking, uh, Q and A at the end of that, and then a, a, an online sort of message board where we get to connect with each other around different topics. So that is a good resource to sort of find your way in. You can learn how I like both my books have over 200 reviews. Um, actually, my newest one just got 201 reviews oh, uh, since it launched in October. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I have a book launch strategies masterclass that I charge for, or you can just get access to it by being a club member. Um, and that, that, that's, that's a great way in on the schmooze is my podcast. So I'd love for people to tune in there as well. And find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm, I love connecting with people. And I'm guessing all those links are on your main webpage as sure, well. Sure. RobbieSamuels.com is a great way in. Perfect. Well, thank you, Robbie, so much. I mean, we could talk for another hour and a half, I'm sure, Clearly. but thank you so much for Thanks. being here. So much great advice and content for our audience. Um, I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So to our audience, thank you so much for tuning in um, to Pathways to Profitability podcast. Um, 
You can find links to all of our episodes on our website, pathways to profitability.com. Be well and have a wonderful day. That's it for today's episode of Pathways to Profitability. Remember to ask yourself, where can I pay my success forward today? 